Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Greenfield from Automotive Ventures, and I'm thrilled to be here for the Work Truck Solutions Commercial Vehicle Business Summit and being your wrap up keynote this afternoon. We want to provide a little bit of perspective on what the future holds in the commercial segment. So we'll dive right in and um, we'll use our crystal ball to give a perspective on what might play out over the next few years. So um, one, one of my favorite sayings is, you know, if you sit still enough and look around, you'll see evidence of the future because it's already all, all around us. And I think that's especially true in the automotive and commercial space, uh, as we'll see some, some evidence of that today. Um, I actually have a book coming out here uh, to coincide with NADA early next year, the future of automotive retail. And I will, you know, provide some of that context and information today. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll dig in. Um, the, the, the chapters of the book, I'm not gonna obviously have in 15 minutes today, time to go into all of this detail, uh, but I did want to spend time on five specific segments and areas that are of particular resonance for the commercial space. And those are the evolution of marketplaces, which are undergoing a, a fairly significant evolution now after being fairly static for some time. I want to spend a little bit of time on that today. Um, in terms of electrical vehicles and the investments and infrastructure that's being invested behind that to support um, a, a fairly uh, major evolution in adoption of EVs. Talk about direct sales with online channels now becoming activated, especially with, with COVID. Um, direct sales and, and the momentum behind those and the implications. Can't have any conversation about short term or mid term without the chip shortage. But in the context of this, it's more about sort of what, what uh, longer term implications there may be as we come out of this, what learnings we'll have that may have a long term implication. And then talking about autonomy overall and how actually commercial is ahead of the curve versus uh, 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 consumer applications for autonomy. And then we will wrap up with a little bit of perspective on the future. So let's dive right in. So first, I stole this from um, Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the most progressive and successful VCs out there. And they've done a, a lot of work looking at the evolution of marketplaces. But when I reflect back in my early days with Mannheim, you know, back in 1999, we were, we were selling cars online in an eBay-like platform. It was a couple of years before we launched a simulcast platform where you could bid real time in a hybrid environment, environment on vehicles. But we've come a long way you know, in 20 years. And uh, at this point, we see a lot of innovation, both within automotive and beyond. But the question is, you know, where are we with marketplaces today or classified providers? And how might things evolve in the future? And the truth is, you know, we're looking at um, a lot of momentum around getting closer to the transaction, um, helping dealers to source and dispose of inventory, and even layering on insurance, uh, allowing folks to buy insurance at the point of purchase. Uh, and I have this example, CarGuru has paid $275 million total valuation for a majority stake in car offer last year. But, you know, CarGuru um, was up until that point, you know, probably classified as a uh, marketplace, mostly used car, but pretty, pretty dramatic change in terms of how marketplaces now are creeping into associated verticals. So from a car offer standpoint, now they allow dealers to source the vehicles that will sell well on their lots and also dispose of vehicles. And as we look at the, the marketplace, what has historically been a fairly defined marketplace, we are seeing a blurring of lines between wholesale and retail. And some of the uh, evidence of that we can see sort of in the great work that Catherine and the team at Work Truck Solutions are doing. One with the VAST product to bring much richer data online for the benefit of dealers that are making decisions around which vehicles to st stock, which vehicles they'll be successful well with, and how those vehicles are equipped. But as we manifest better and more accurate data online, we're enabling us all to get closer to an ultimate online transaction. And then, you know, build the order as well, um, you know, through this chip, chip crisis, as you know, I'll get to in a few minutes, has become much more top of mind to, to, to OEMs and to dealers in terms of, you know, taking the opportunity to migrate a greater percentage of their vehicles to build the order. And it's to be determined how many of the OEMs will learn from this and build into their processes more systemic changes that will support build to order uh, processes into the future. But those that are successful in doing so will absolutely be able to provide a better customer experience and at the same time drive more profit margin through the process. 
Let's transition uh, beyond marketplaces now to EV innovation and investments. So, you know, big news a couple of years ago was that Amazon was purchasing 100,000 uh, vans in advance of Rivian. This was only at the concept stage. And now, you know, if you go to Los Angeles and other cities, you can see these things on the street as they're testing them out. But amazing to see the progress that we've made in two years. And if you watch the press last week, Rivian um, put the, the first uh, pickup truck off of the production line last week. So um, they, they are rumored to be doing uh, something like an $80 billion IPO later this year as they go to market. So that'll be definitely one to watch. But the, the investments in EV infrastructure, uh, battery technologies, and even the migration towards EVs and accelerating that for OEMs is formidable. And you almost can't you know, um, spend one day without picking up the press and seeing evidence of that. Yesterday, we, we heard about Ford investing $50 million into a, a business called Redwood Materials. And really, you know, when we think about battery technology, we need to also think about a couple of things. One is sourcing um, the raw constituents of the batteries themselves. Right now, a lot of those are sourced internationally, but the better we can be self-sufficient in, in the US, uh, the better it will be for the auto industry here. But also from a reclamation at the end, you know, when it comes to an internal combustion engine vehicle, it can be exported overseas and whether it goes into Africa somewhere or the Middle East or, or even down into Mexico, um, you know, gas is a universal standard. It won't be the same thing with EVs, right? So we won't be able to just ship them overseas and hope that somewhere in Afghanistan or Iraq or the Middle East or you know, Northern Africa that they'll have the charging infrastructure to support these. So all the more important, not only from a scrappage and making sure that there's a residual value at the end, but also ensuring from an environmental standpoint that we get smarter. And we're seeing now OEMs make big bets in, in those types of areas. So whether it's, it's a charging infrastructure, whether it's the battery technology themselves, or even into, um, as, as this investment uh, we saw yesterday with Ford, uh, battery rec reclamation afterwards, we'll, we'll definitely see a lot more investments in these areas going forward, and they may even accelerate. All right, so let's switch on to uh, number three, which is online sales. Uh, a topic of conversation and you know big implications around uh, build build to order online um, and uh, the data that's needed to support that from a commercial standpoint. You know, interestingly, if I, I, I pulled out a couple of quotes that you know we've seen in the press over the last week or so, uh, one from Rivian to say with Rivian for a minute. You know, Rivian's going to skirt dealer protection laws in the U.S. because they won't have any physical sites. So unlike Tesla that puts up these showrooms, Rivian will be selling directly to consumer online and they won't have any restrictions. Right now, uh, as of today, 22 states allow for you know, vehicle manufacturers to sell vehicles to consumers. Um, you know, Rivian can sell directly um, you know, uh, to consumers without any, without any res restrictions. So I think it'll be very interesting to see you know, how franchise laws try to um, regulate some of these uh, direct competitors to dealers as more and more of these, uh, these, these sellers that are in some cases are selling commercial vehicles, try to sell directly to consumers without um, having to um, have the, the dealership infrastructure to support afterwards. So that will be interesting to watch. Uh, number two is I, I pulled this out of a, a Volvo quote recently and uh, Volvo CEO was talking very publicly about how their plan is as, as they migrate to a greater percentage of their fleet being EV, they're going to move towards a, a planned central stock model where the consumer will configure an order online. The automaker will actually carry the inventory on its balance sheet and then deliver the vehicle to the dealership as a point of delivery. But what, where, where this will cause friction, as you can imagine, will be who ultimately owns the customer, who will be spending the marketing dollars? Um, the dealer uh, typically makes a lot of money up, up, upfitting the vehicle and adding accessories and F&I products. Wh who, who will own those revenue streams going forward? And then equally important, like from a service standpoint, if the dealer hasn't had the opportunity to build rapport with the consumer uh, or customer one-on-one, -on -one, who will get the service work down the road? So I think all of this will play out very, very quickly and is only being accelerated by this move to electric electrification and, and more and more of the, the, the fleet moving to electric. Let's talk about the ship, chip shortage. Um, you know, if COVID was the big story last year in terms of the implications on new cars and, and, uh, and uh, factories being shut down, this year it's more been around the, the chip shortage and supply constraints and the fact that we can't 
you know, build build vehicles, and we have to pause pause um, uh, the, the the factories as a result. So the the, the chip shortage has OEMs sort of reevaluating the retail channel. Uh, more OEMs, you know, like like Volvo and others, are signaling that EVs will be bought online and dealers inserted as sort of like dumber delivery points overall, as we saw two slides back. You know, th this came out this morning. This was Alex Partners, a consulting firm, you know, re reforecasting more aggressively what cost the chip shortage will have on the industry. And this is up fairly significantly from just a few months ago. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're um, now estimating that, you know, in this calendar year, 2021, that we're already three quarters of the way through, we'll, we'll be short 7.7 .7 million units globally, which will equate to about $210 billion in foregone uh, revenue. And it's not as if, you know, you know people are gonna forego this and pick up next year. You know, people need vehicles. And uh, equally true with commercial vehicles as, as consumer vehicles. And what, what, how this will play out is it, it's really supported the secondary market used uh, vehicle prices. And there, there, there has been substitution moving from new to used, but it's really inflated prices on the used side and caused a shortage on the used side as well. So hopefully so, some of these uh, purchases can be delayed. And when, when, when you know, inventory levels come back to, to normal, we'll be able to pick up and have a, have a bump up in, in sales next year. But the truth is a lot of that won't carry forward because you know, folks that otherwise would have bought new will be buying, buying used. But having said that, um, it's, it's very interesting to see how OEMs may be taking opportunity to learn from these shortages, um, fine tune the supply line. Some of that may migrate over to build to order long-term, but the question really will be which OEMs and dealers le learn to, um, you know, constrain their costs through this and not get back to their old ways of working and, and figure out if they can migrate a larger percentage of their consumers to build to order, which inherently should be more profitable for both the dealer and the consumer. So let's now move to the final section, section five on autonomy. And um, I think we're doing well with time here. But, um, you know, interestingly, you know, commercial has been where we've seen real um, application of innovation of AVs um, uh, more so than for consumer applications. You know, I, I couldn't help but sort of yank out an old consulting chart, but if you believe the consulting firms five years ago, this is Accenture and not to single out Accenture because I think all the consultants were much more bullish on the adoption of you know, um, level five full autonomy for consumers. But you know, if you'd believe that, you, we would have already have seen you know, a, a percentage of the cars on the road being full level five autonomous, and we would have had robo -talk taxis in some of the more dense cities around the world, including in the US, and it just hasn't played out for, for a number of reasons that I don't really have the time to go into today, but a lot of it has been, you know, we need to just get more miles under our belts to learn and, and have the sort of like the machines learn how better to navigate, you know, the, the imperfections. It's great to put these on the road of Sunnyvale, California, or Phoenix, Arizona, but when you bring in more uncertainty around weather conditions and driving conditions and busier roads, et cetera, and road conditions, um, you know, we, we're, we're going to have years before we can feel confident about uh, autonomy to drive consumers around. But having said that, what we've seen as a result is much more innovation and ado adoption in terms of, you know, level five autonomy for, for, um, uh, for fleets. So um, you know, we, we see great progress being made when you, you, you aren't transporting humans as cargo. Um, and you know, it, it started off with smaller robots, smaller vehicles moving, moving cargo around. But you know, very quickly here, we're seeing some pretty sophisticated test, tests of technologies with, with large uh, vehicles. And I think this is gonna be great because not, not unlike you know, if, you, if you're a racing fan and you are either like F1 or NASCAR or motorcycles, what they learn you know, on the racetracks trickles down very quickly to consumer vehicles. And I think we'll see that dynamic play out here as you know, we, we learn much more quickly with commercial vehicles. And these, these vehicles are able to incur many, many more miles put on these vehicles. That technology, as we learn, will trickle down very, very quickly to you know, ADAS and autonomy um, autonomous um, technologies in consumer vehicles, which is really exciting and will be definitely something to keep our eye on. And um, good to see that you know commercial vehicles will be adopting AV technologies much more quickly than consumers. So that that's it. Um, five um, five sections here. I would say that um, a lot of change coming. Um, in addition to these areas, you know, being a fund manager now, there are other areas that we're interested in. 
Um, you know, it, which includes, you know, charging infrastructure to support EVs as we get more EVs on the road. Uh, we have big question marks around, will we have enough charging infrastructure to support them? The battery technology as well, there's a lot of innovation going in battery technology now to increase life, to increase the recyclability of the, the constituents of the batteries, but also the, the, you know, being able to swap out batteries potentially and or fast charge batteries. And then we also um, are, are looking at micro mobility and mobility as a service, right? So a lot of innovation there, but you know, not the least of which you know, uh, areas that we're interested in is at the bottom commercial vehicle innovation. And, and you know, we're keen to make investments in this space because we think that you know th th this industry and not not the least of which is because of you know folks like work truck solutions out there are is really evolving very very quickly you know we talked about autonomous vehicles the the data that's going to be needed um you know uh, build to order etc but i think that you know we're very bullish on the commercial segment in general and believe there are multiple billion dollar companies that will come out of this as you know these big pain points are are, are, are solved by innovative companies in the future. Here's my contact information, uh, my mobile phone, as well as my email address and our website. Um, happy to chat with anybody but the industry at any time. I live and breathe this stuff, but greatly um, uh, appreciate the opportunity that Work Truck Solutions and, uh, has provided me for the Commercial Vehicle Business Summit to be your, your wrapping keynote and hopefully shed a light a little bit on the, the themes that we'll see into the future. And with that, I will pass that back to our moderator. Thank you for having me today.